Good morning, Duck Church. It is good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Um, we welcome you here, and we're going to get started praising the Lord. Um, we're singing a newer song to us, but hopefully there's a lot of y'all here on vacation, and you know it too. So sing it out, clap along with us, and let's stand together.
change I don't want to abuse your grace Gotta need it every day It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change I don't want to abuse your grace Gotta need it every day Your grace, God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change your forgiveness. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of a symphony in my ears. Like holy. from Philippians chapter 3 verse 10 I want to know Christ can we say that together I want to know Christ yes to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead I think we all want to know Christ right <laughs> that's why we're here this morning um and I think we really desire the power of God that's proved in his resurrection, but we forget that sometimes that comes together coupled with the suffering of Christ. You can't have a resurrection without the death of Jesus. And so as believers, if we're connected with Jesus Christ, just as Jesus experienced suffering and hardship and difficulty, we're too going to experience that kind of hardship and difficulty. But because we know Jesus we know that one day we will overcome. It might happen in this life or it might happen when we're with him in heaven. Um, but let's sing of how we are overcoming through the power of the Lord as we suffer. Yeah. 
us out Light in this broken land All authority Every victory Is yours Savior Worthy of honor and glory Worthy of all our praise You overcame trust you and we trust that your holy spirit can make us more like you as you live through us we pray this in your name jesus amen if you take a second and greet some of the folks who are standing around you
Good morning. Welcome to Duck Church. My name is Chris. I'm the pastor here. And we are so glad that you chose to join us today as we worship our Lord and Savior in the house of God. The Bible says in Psalm 122, verse 1, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. You know, in this day and age with a myriad of church services available either at the click of a mouse or the push of a button on a remote control, there's nothing quite like being in the house of the Lord. So uh, thank you for braving the traffic and getting here today. Uh, I know the Lord had some great things in store for us this morning. As we begin our time together, if you will find your connection card in your bulletin, it looks like this one, and if you would take a moment to complete as much information as you feel comfortable in sharing on the front of that, it does help us to get to know you a little bit better and also how we might better serve you, pray with you or for you if you uh, wish to share a request with us. Over on the back side, uh, there's a place where you can share your prayer request, but <clears throat> there's also um, a number of next steps. And um, today we're going to be focusing on living a great life. And so there are a number of practical steps that we'll talk about uh, at the conclusion of the message today. So for now, hang on to your connection card. We'll give you some time later in the service to finish up anything that uh, you haven't completed. And uh, we'll take them up toward the end of the service. So this morning we're focused on uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 24 through chapter 2, verse 1. And the message is the difference between a great life and an easy life. I came across something Max Licato wrote about life. You know, Max Licato wrote about a lot of things. Uh, and this is what he said about life. God never said that the journey would be easy, but he did say that the, the arrival would be worthwhile. Uh, everyone is welcome here in the Duck Church family where we gather for worship today so we can prepare for that worthwhile uh, arrival. So uh, as we turn our attention now to the ministry of prayer, I have some um, prayer concerns and perhaps we'll have others that we want to add to our list. Uh, I'd like us to pray for Louise Sawyer and her family. Her husband, Jimmy, uh, died Friday morning. Uh, tentative, tentatively, the uh, funeral plans are for Monday the 21st at 1 o'clock here at the church. So uh, let's uh, lift uh, Louise and her family in prayer. Uh, also, Nancy Terry is suffering with a fractured foot. Brenda Sanders has upcoming uh, knee replacement. Uh, there were some fires here on the Outer Banks last week, uh, one right here at Four Seasons, uh, another one farther down uh, in Kill Devil Hills where three people lost their lives, three others were injured. Uh, we want to lift up uh, those folks, and as we're thinking about fires, we also want to think about the people in Maui. There are a number of people who have lost their lives in the, in the fires there. And then I received some very uh, sad and distressing news this morning. Uh, John Tyson, former pastor here, at Duck Church, uh, his oldest daughter, Joanna, died Thursday morning, and she leaves behind two small children. So I don't know any other details other than that, but uh, prayers are appreciated for John and for his family during this uh, devastating time. Are there others that we should <laughs> lift in prayer? Yes. How Luke and Kelly. Got it. Yes. Vicky and Cynthia. Yes. Talon, thank you. Yes. Delbert. Evan. Anybody? Yep. Teachers. Oh, man. We might have to bump you to the top of the list. <laughs> teachers. Thank God for teachers. David. Okay. 
That's all right. It's on his mind this morning. So, all right. So we'll we'll uh, pray for healing for that, David. Thank you for sharing that with me. Uh, yes. Cesar, Matt, and Emily. All right, anybody else? Yes? I'd like to lift up a couple of praise. We got struck by lightning, and hey, we're sitting here today. Yeah, we did have some equipment that's down, um, but that's light compared to what happened just right, right down here. So, yes? My grandson, Jake, has COVID. Jake with COVID. Anybody else? Yes? Martha. Martha. Okay. <coughs> yes? sure they are too isn't isn't it a wonderful thing that god invented air conditioning <laughs> wow glad they got back safe all right let's uh let's go before the lord then as we pray father we uh we come to you today in the name of jesus and we rejoice in you and we give thanks for all that you do for us but most of all we thank you for for who you are we thank you for salvation through the blood of Christ. We, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming into our world and becoming one of us. And because of that, we have the hope of eternity with you and with all those that have gone before us. We thank you for the great heritage we enjoy because of all the people that have made up Duck Church down through the years. We are included in that wonderful family. We follow in their train and we acknowledge that we have a responsibility not only to our present generation but to those from the past and especially those coming after us. And we want to be faithful to the sacred trust that's ours and we joyfully accept that responsibility. And now, Father, we, we bring the needs of your people today. Some in this room have come with special burdens and concerns and maybe nobody knows but you. And you're the one who can do something about it. Bring encouragement and lift them up. Many have physical needs and they're looking to you right now. Some have spiritual needs. They've been defeated and have succumbed to temptation and they seek your forgiveness. And there are many in our world who are grieving. We think about uh, the families here on the Outer Banks who are grieving loved ones who died in the fire and many who are grieving the loss of loved ones in Maui and especially our, our thoughts turn to John Tyson and his family in the face of the death of, of his, son, uh, his daughter. Um, we pray for their family that they might know your comfort by your presence with them. There are, there are no words that any human being could, could offer that could heal the pain. But the offering of yourself brings a standard of peace that is beyond our ability to comprehend. We pray that you would minister to that family with your love and your grace and help them to know that you are a very present help in time of trouble. We commend them to your care, praying that you might give them your peace. Lord, you are the God of all grace and 
you are the God of our faith. You are our confidence. As we reach out to you today, we know that you're already reaching out to us. So thank you for the help that you're giving right now in this moment. Thank you for leading us as a church. You've put plans and and ministries in the hearts of our leaders and we want your continued guidance and direction. Thank you for the wisdom and understanding that you give that enables us to do far better than we could ever do with our own resources and abilities. We love you, Father. And we're very grateful for your never-ending love for us. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning as we uh, turn our attention to the book of Colossians, I want to say that I believe with all my heart that this is the Holy Spirit-inspired Word of God. It is... God's word of hope for all of humanity. And today as we look at how to live a great life, let's be attentive as God's word is read so that we might apply it to our lives and discover the joys and the treasures that God has in store for us this morning. So listen for the word of God. Paul is writing to the church in Colossae. I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for his body at the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. For God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles too. And this is the secret. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing his glory. So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom God has given us. We want to present them to God perfect in their relationship to Christ. That's why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea and for many other believers who have never met me personally. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, by your Holy Spirit, illumine the sacred page, we pray that our minds may be open to receive your word, our hearts taught to love it, and our wills strengthened to obey it. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen. If you were to uh, make a list of the most successful people that you know, who would be on it? Bill Gates? Jeff Bezos, Lee Iacocca, Ronald Reagan, John F. Kennedy, Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, Mother Teresa, Billy Graham. I don't know, it's your list. There could be hundreds of people that you could choose from. However, I'm sure of one thing about all the people that would make your list. Each of these individuals will share certain characteristics, certain beliefs and attitudes that contributed to their success. Now, we all know that there's a difference between wealth and success. There's also a difference between power and success. So what then is the mark of true success? More than just having things or doing things, success can be defined as living a great life. And this will, of course, include accomplishments, and it may include financial rewards, recognition, and many other things that people often associate with success, but it's also more than that. It means living a life that makes a difference, living a life that has a positive impact on those around you, living a life that benefits others even generations after you're gone. 
In that case, in order to be successful, you don't have to be a celebrity, you don't have to be rich, but there are three things that you have to be willing to do. In the last few verses of the first chapter of Colossians, Paul discusses these three attitudes and they drove him to become the person that he was. And it is in these attitudes that we can see a blueprint for success. If you apply them to your job, your ministry, your marriage, your children, your dreams, your goals, or anything else, you will be successful. So let's take a look at them. First of all, in order to succeed in life, you must be willing to suffer. And the congregation cheered, right? We're so excited about suffering. When, when we look at successful people, we only see the fruits of their success. We don't see the heartaches and the pains and the loneliness that goes along with it. In 1999, uh, Tar Tiger Woods made the record books when he won his fourth straight tournament, his eighth tournament of the year, and he finished the tour that year with more than $6 million in earnings. And the thing is, he made it look so easy. Well, he had some hard times to come yet, uh, and he faced those. Um, but, you know, we see the fame and we see the money and the adulation, and we're often tempted to think, boy, it must be tough, <laughs> you know. We don't see how Tiger Woods suffered to get to where he was. We don't see the multiplied thousands of hours he spent alone on the golf course mastering his technique while he could have been at home watching TV, which is where most of us were. We easily forget about the resistance that he faced because of the color of his skin when he entered professional golfing. We don't consider that he has, has to face every day people who are jealous of his success. In fact, one year when he was playing in the World Golf Championship in Spain, every time he made a bad shot, every time a break didn't go his way, the crowd cheered. Now, how would you like it if when you went to work or in your personal life, there were hundreds of people on the sidelines celebrating every time you made a mistake? Some of you may feel that way already. I know many pastors who do. If you want to be successful, you have to be willing to suffer. You have to be willing to put in longer hours than you want, endure criticism that you don't deserve, and give more than sometimes you're able to give. If you're willing to pay the price, you will succeed. And Paul was willing to, to pay that price. Notice what he says in verse 24. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. Now when Paul makes reference to what is still lacking in Christ's afflictions, he's not saying that Christ's death on the cross wasn't sufficient for our salvation. He's saying that everyone who wants to live a godly life must suffer. In suffering, we unite ourselves with Christ. Paul is saying that what is lacking is his own experience of Christ's suffering in his day-to-day -day life. He's saying that in order to live a great life, you must be willing to suffer. Several years ago now, I had the opportunity to visit Saddleback Valley Community Church and Mission Viejo, California, and about 15,000 people attended worship that weekend, a little more than what we've got here this morning. Um, <clears throat> the church was started by Rick Warren, who, as I'm sure you know, is a church growth expert and the author of the best-selling book, The Purpose Driven Life. Today, success looks very easy for him, but he had to suffer to get to where he is. In the early days of his ministry, he was ostracized by many in his denomination because he didn't use the word Baptist in the church name. He was accused of preaching self-help sermons instead of the gospel, and more recently, the Southern Baptist Convention kicked his church and others out because those churches happened to believe in the ministry of women. He was also accused of putting his church in an affluent area where he could reach the easily reachable. 
One guy dismissed his success by saying anyone can succeed in California. Of course, that's easy for somebody from North Carolina to say. Any pastor in California would probably disagree. But Rick Warren is successful because he was willing to suffer. He has endured criticisms and setbacks and health problems and family struggles and disloyal staff members and every other hindrance that I would not wish on any other pastor. And yet, because of his willingness to suffer, he stayed and he succeeded. I know of a pastor of a large church who was getting ready to leave for vacation one year and someone anonymously gave him a nicely wrapped gift. He stuffed it in a suitcase and he left and when he got to the cabin where he was staying that week, he unpacked his suitcase, took out the gift and unwrapped it and inside the box was a brand new leather bound Bible. And he opened it up and he read the note inside and this is what the note said. Dear Pastor, here is a Bible. Why don't you consider using it when you preach? I am tired of hearing you soft pedal the word of God week after week. He was crushed by this criticism. But as a pastor, he knows that it often comes with success. The fact is, most people would crack under the pressure that successful individuals must endure. If you want to be successful, you've got to be tough. You must be willing to endure criticism. You must be willing to work. You must be willing to give above and beyond the call of duty. You must be willing to suffer. The second attitude that Paul mentions is you must be willing to serve. Jesus made this plain when he said in Matthew 20, the Son of Man did, didn't come to be served, but to serve. He also said in Luke 6, the student is not above the teacher. So if Jesus came to serve others, then we have to serve. Do you remember when politicians used to be called public servants? Uh, sometimes it seems like that concept has disappeared. I, I, I'm amazed when I read some of the things that politicians do to sway the public. Once, one, uh, one politician that I read about paid $15,000 a month in consulting fees to a woman who was listed as a wardrobe consultant and was reported to give, this, uh, give her political advice on shirt and tie combinations. $15,000 a month. Jesse Ventura made a similar mistake shortly after he was elected to serve the people of Minnesota. He gave an interview with Playboy magazine and said, Organized religion is a sham and a crutch for weak-minded people. Ventura's approval rating dropped 19 points overnight, and his remarks conflicted with the opinion of 75% of the people he was supposed to be committed to serving. Now, obviously, this is not the attitude of a servant, and it's certainly not the attitude that leads to success. We're called to lead, but becoming a leader requires that we do two things well. We must first identify with those that we lead, and then we must be willing to serve those we lead. This is what Paul said about the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me. Now, Paul was undoubtedly the most significant leader of the first century church, but he led people by serving people. He gave his life for them. He endured hardship for them. He sacrificed for them. He committed his life to teaching the word of God, telling people about Jesus and showing them how to grow as Christians. Paul understood a crucial principle. Success is not a life of privilege. It's a life of service. Dave Thomas was the founder and multimillionaire owner of Wendy's Restaurants. When he was alive, the commercials, if you'll remember them, uh, they were always a little corny, but uh, they, they featured him behind the counter of a Wendy's flipping burgers for customers. He had the right idea. Success is not a life of privilege. It's a life of service. If you want to be successful, you must be willing to serve. 
But you must realize that you can only live a life of service if you're committed to loving others. Do you remember the movie? It was not a great movie. Uh, Superman 2. Uh, when Zod and his two associates came to earth and they took over the government by force and one of them said about Superman, I see his weakness. He actually cares for these humans. Superman used his power to serve people. Zod used his power to exploit people. A leader who loves people devotes his or her life to serving them. And this attitude ultimately leads to success. A leader who doesn't love people spends his or her life using them, and this attitude always leads to failure. If you want to be successful, you must be willing to serve. The third Paul mentions is you must be willing to struggle. Success isn't about having an easy life. It's about living a great life, and that takes work. If your goal is anything less than greatness, you will eventually quit. True success requires life, a lifelong willingness to remain in the struggle. If you ever had the opportunity to watch the late Peyton Man, uh, the late Walter Peyton, not Peyton Manning, although he was great too, he wasn't a great running back. Um, you, you, you know that Walter Peyton was perhaps the greatest running back that ever put on uh, shoulder pads. Uh, the thing that sticks out to me about Walter Payton is a brief film that I saw showing off his off-season routine. I remember seeing him in the heat of summer running up a hill covered in loose rocks and, and dirt and he would stumble his way up the hill and he would sprint down and then he would sprint back up and I remember thinking he's already the best. Why is he doing this? He's got plenty of money He's got the starting job in the backfield in, in Chicago. No one's ever going to take that away. Why is he working so hard in the offseason? And the answer is obvious. Peyton realized that no matter how much you succeed, you never, stop, you never stop struggling. You never quit. And too often, I think we miss this point. We tend to think that when you get to a certain level of achievement, you've got it made. And that isn't how it is at all. When you get to the NFL, you don't have it made. When you get to the NFL, the real work is just beginning. The more you succeed, the harder you have to work. The struggle never ends. Paul's struggle was to lead others into a life-changing relationship with Jesus, and he refused to give up. He said, to this end I labor, struggling with all energy which so powerfully works in me. He goes on to say, I want you to know how much I am struggling for you, for those in Laodicea and for those who have not met me personally. Success requires a commitment to hard work. I, I don't see these much anymore. Maybe I'm not staying up late at night, uh, uh, enough at night to see those infomercials. They're probably still on. You can still see them on the internet. But those infomercials that promise an easy way to get rich, you know, you notice how these shows seem to appear to be effortless? I mean, some young guy in his 20s, not even sure he's shaving yet, comes on the screen and he says, what if I were to tell you that by placing a tiny classified ad, you could be rich beyond your wildest dreams? And then they, they show testimonials of, uh, testimonials of people saying things like, I don't even own a computer. But I bought one internet ad for $60, and last month I made $60,000. I mean, they made success look so easy, but there's one major problem. It's not. That's why guys, guys who sell get-rich-quick methods disappear so quickly. The guys who were doing this 10 years ago aren't doing it anymore. Some are bankrupt, some are in jail for fraud, but none have been able to sustain a long-term career because their message is flawed. Success is not easy. It requires hard work, a lifelong commitment to struggle. The more you succeed, the more you have to struggle. 
So anytime you see a successful business or a successful team or a successful church or a successful marriage, you can be sure that someone has paid the price and stayed in the struggle in order to succeed. And I want you to realize that it is absolutely worth it. Our goal isn't money, fame, prestige, or power. Our goal is to live a great life. Steve Camp's song, Run to the Battle, says this. I love this lyric. Some people want to live within the sound of a chapel bell, but I want to run a mission a mile from the gates of hell. That's what success really is. It's not about living an easy life. It's about living a great life. And you know, if you put your mind to it, you can get through life without too much effort. You can coast through your job, your marriage, your commitment to your children, and never allow yourself to be inconvenienced. But if you want to succeed, it'll require much more. You must be willing to suffer. You must be willing to serve. You must be willing to struggle. That is the difference between an easy life and a great one. Let's pray together. Father, we confess to you that sometimes we look for the fruit of success and try to bypass the struggle. Help us to know that true greatness comes from a commitment to suffer, to serve, and to struggle. And help us to not only aspire for greatness, but to attain it as we focus on these three attitudes that made Paul such a great leader in the early church. 2,000 years later, we're still talking about him and what he had to say. Father, help us never to settle for mediocrity. Help us to aim to live a great life in Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, friends, in just a moment, we're going to receive the offering. So I'd like everybody, if you will, to get your connection card back out and consider what your next step will be this week. You know, sometimes, as, as I said, I think we might be tempted to think that we can achieve greatness without breaking a sweat. The truth is, in any worthwhile endeavor, and certainly in trying to live a great life in Christ, it requires so much more. So... The next steps this week are challenging for all of us. So I would ask you to consider where you are and what next step you're ready to take in order to move from easy to greatness. Now, if you're with us for the first time today, we've got a a little gift for you. It's a little book called How Good is Good Enough. It's written by Andy Stanley, and it's all about how to know for certain that you'll go to heaven one day. We want you to be sure about that. Um, So... All you need to do is put your completed connection card in the offering plate when it's passed in just a moment. And then when you leave today, there's a table on the right side on the back wall as you're going out that's filled with copies of this book. And they are there for you. Please pick one up, take it home and read it. It's our way of saying thank you for worshiping with us today. So we keep our focus on God's unfolding kingdom on earth. Keep your heart open, allowing it to spill on everyone you meet. If you have a financial offering, place it in the plate, but more importantly, place your hand over it and silently commit to God to use your gifts, talents, and heart for furthering the unfolding kingdom of God on earth. Let's worship God now.
stand together and magnify the name of Christ.
Friends, if you're in town next weekend, be sure to come back next Sunday as we continue our series of messages from the book of Colossians. Next week, we're going to be looking at Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, and the message will be what to look for in a church. I hope that you'll be here, and I hope you'll invite someone to worship with you. And if you can't be here, you can join us online or on our uh, church website and uh, keep up that way. Let's uh, receive this blessing this morning, which comes from Romans 15. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ.